All right, Brother Mike, you're good to start. Thank you. And take the time that you need. I know we're running a little bit late, okay? Okay. All right, Second uh, Chronicles 35, please. Second Chronicles chapter 35, and I'm going to read the first six verses. And in the will of the Lord, we'll cover more than that. But uh, just for the time, I want to just read the first six verses of this chapter. So it says in verse 1 of Second Chronicles 35, Moreover, Josiah kept a Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem. And they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. And he set the priests in their charges and encouraged them to the service of the house of the Lord and said unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy unto the Lord, put the holy ark in the house, which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build. It shall not be a burden upon your shoulders. Serve now the Lord your God and his people Israel. And prepare yourselves by the houses of your fathers after your courses, according to the writing of David, king of Israel, and according to the writing of Solomon, his son, and stand in the holy place according to the divisions of the families of the fathers of your brethren, the people, and after the division of the families of the Levites. So kill the Passover and sanctify yourselves and prepare your brethren that they may do according to the word of the Lord by the hands of Moses. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. And again, it is a joy to be with you for this 100th anniversary conference. And again, and also with Brother Thomas, it's been a real pleasure and a blessing. And I trust it's been encouraging uh, to you as we've considered uh, the life of this uh, man, Josiah. And just to review quickly, we, we learned uh, in the previous sessions the purpose of Josiah, which was to seek uh, the Lord his God. And then we learned of his passion, that as he drew near to God, uh, he began to be aware of everything that was displeasing to God. And so we, his passion was to cleanse the land of idolatry and even cleanse the house. And so he, he sets about this work with great zeal and passion. And then we saw that as they were cleaning the house out uh, and refurbishing the house of God, they found a scroll uh, with the word of the Lord in it. And we saw the penitence of this man, Josiah, as the word of God came to him with real power. And he was convicted of it, tore his garments, had a tender heart, trembled at God's word. Uh, we saw just the very marvelous way that he responded to the word of God. And really, we're kind of car carrying on with the, his response to the word of God because he wants to do everything that he sees in the word of God, and it, he wants to hold the Passover. And so we want to think about this Passover. And again, uh, I said in Bible study methods, if you just go through underlined repeated words and phrases, uh, you're going to see this chapter, the Passover is repeated over and over and over again, the word Passover. So clearly that's what the Spirit's intention is for us to consider as we look at this chapter together is the Passover. Now, I want to remind us that, that we're in the 11th hour of the history of the nation before impending judgment and captivity falls upon them. And yet, in divine grace and mercy, the Lord would give Israel one of their brightest and most memorable weeks the nation ever had. Uh, this week is going to be so marvelous that they're going to have to go all the way back to the book of uh, judges or the days of Samuel to have anything that even compares to this week. And I think that's a great encouragement to us that all, all this was really due to the faith of this king whose might, mind and heart had been reached by the word of God. And he desired that both himself and his people might be wholly obedient to the word of God. And I, I thought the encouragement to me is this, that we're living also in the late evening of the dispensation of the church. But could it be that God would give us a, a last, as it were, a high watermark of his presence and his blessing prior to the coming of that great and terrible day of the Lord? I heard a man uh, yesterday 
he was telling me that he had been involved in assembly fellowship for 68 years. I won't tell you how old he was, but he had been involved in assembly fellowship for 68 years. And he said the last five years, he has never seen more prayer and more burden for revival amongst the assemblies than in the previous 63 years. And he said, I'm convinced God is going to do something. And I thought, wow, what an encouragement. Being in assembly fellowship 68 years, the last five years, more concentrated, determined prayer and interest and burden for revival than all the previous years. So maybe in uh, the evening, the late evening of the church dispensation, God might indeed shower a time of unprecedented blessing upon us again that we read about here uh, in the end of this age, this great blessing in this Passover. Now, the reason we could say this Passover was so significant, look with me, please, back to Second Kings chapter 23, Second uh, Kings 23, and we want to just see what it says about this Passover, and then we'll compare it with what it says in Chronicles. But Second Kings 23, verse 22, it says, uh, well, we read from verse 21 for the connection. The king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there was not holden such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. Sorry, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. So quite clearly, this Passover was, was outstanding. Uh, compared to past history, this is, this is a high watermark event. Look at chapter 35, our chapter in Second Chronicles, in verse 18. Chapter 35, verse 18, it says, There was no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. Neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept, and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So, so quite clearly, this is the most outstanding Passover since the days of the judges or the days of Samuel the prophet. We'll talk about why the, the two connections between judges and Samuel in a moment. But first of all, as we, as we consider this, I want us to ask the question, as we look at this passage before us, what made this Passover different from all that had gone before that it receives such glowing reviews uh, from the writer of the Kings, the writer of the Chronicles. What makes it so outstanding? If you recall, in the days of Hezekiah, there was also a wonderful Passover at that time. But one of the differences of that Passover, and let's just look back at Second Chronicles 30 just for a moment, Second Chronicles 30 about Hezekiah's Passover, and we'll notice there was a, there was a difference. And it, verses 1 and 2 of Second Chronicles 30, it says, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters to, also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month, for they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And so one thing we noticed about Hezekiah's Passover was it wasn't done at the proper time. And he kind of looked back to the book of Numbers and saw that there was kind of this little kind of clause there that if people weren't properly cleansed, that they, and that yet they wanted to keep the Passover, but they weren't properly cleansed on the 14th day of the first month, that there was a possibility they could do it in the second month. And so that's what he had to do because the people were not properly purified. Whereas Josiah, as we said yesterday, nobody had been more thorough and complete in the cleansing of idolatry from the land and the cleansing of the people than Josiah. 
And so they were able to do it on the correct day. Again, look at chapter 35, verse 1. It says, Moreover, Josiah kept the Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem. They killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month, right on schedule, exactly the day when they were supposed to do it is the day that they did it. And so we might say that Josiah, what made his Passover so outstanding was the scrupulous observance of the word of God by both king and people. That is what made this Passover so outstanding. And again, isn't it good? God is pleased when his people are scrupulous in their obedience of his word. It shows that they, they respect him when they take the word of God so seriously. And this man took God's word very seriously. And uh, because the book of the law had been discovered, it had come to renewed prominence. And Josiah desired that every enactment should be carefully observed. And God had spoken through Moses, David, and Solomon concerning the ordinance of divine worship. And Josiah determined that all should be carried out just as specified. And I want us to just observe something in the text for a moment. And I want you just to notice with me a phrase, according to. And it's going to be repeated numerous times in this chapter. And again, it shows his diligence to do things biblically according to Revelation. So notice verse 4, please, as we just run through this this, this man, the stickler for the word of God, he wanted it done right. Notice verse 4, prepare yourselves by the houses of your fathers after your courses according to the writing of David, king of Israel, and according to the writing of Solomon, his son. Notice verse 6, kill the Passover, sanctify yourselves, prepare your brethren, that they may do, and again, this phrase again, according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. Look at verse 10. So the service was prepared, and the priests stood in their place, and the Levites in their courses, according to the king's commandment. Now again, this is King Josiah, but King Josiah, his commandment is motivated by the commandment of David and Solomon and Moses. Look again at verse 13. They roasted the Passover with fire according to the ordinance. Again, according to what God said in his word. Verse 15. And the singers, the sons of Asaph, were in their places according to the commandment of David and Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, the king's seer. And then again, verse 16. So all the service of the Lord was prepared the same day to keep the Passover and offer the burnt offering upon the altar of the Lord according to the commandment of King Josiah. And again, you just get this idea that there's this uh, passion. We, we talk, this man's passionate, and he's passionate about doing everything according to the word of God. And again, I believe that's why this Passover is so outstanding. It's so pleasing to the Lord when his people are submissive to the word of God and want things done biblically and correctly. I want to read from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. You don't have to necessarily turn there, but just this lovely phrase, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. And certainly it could be said of Josiah that he did things as it was written, according to the word of God, according to as it is written. And so, again, this man, a stickler for the word of God. Now, I want you to just look at a couple of references in the Gospel of John for a moment. John chapter 6 and John chapter 4. John 6, John 4. So John 6, verse 4, and John 7, verse 2. John 6, verse 4, it says, The Passover... A feast of the Jews was nigh. And then chapter 7, please, of John's Gospel, verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And I want us to notice something different. You see, in Leviticus 23, 
when originally these festivals, these Jewish holy days were given by God and were, were commanded by God for the people to keep them, they were called the Feasts of Jehovah. But by the time we get to John's Gospel, John very carefully tells us they were the Feasts of the Jews. And it's almost like Jehovah was kind of sidelined and they were going on with their religious rituals but he was not part of it anymore and you wonder well why would that be what had happened and i want to suggest to you that genuine heart for the lord was lacking genuine heart for the lord was lacking it had become for them a going through the motions it had become a ritual and the, the Lord was not in it. Isaiah chapter one, he talks the same way. He talks about your new moons, your festivals are wearisome to me. My soul hates them, God said, because they, they were just going through the motions. When we think of Josiah, not only did he do it according to the word of the Lord, but one thing we know about Josiah was whatever he did, he did it with his whole heart. And so it, it's, it's biblical, but it's also passionate. Uh, the, the heart of Josiah and the heart of the people was in it. And uh, there, there was this great passion. And I want to suggest to you that when, when genuine revival comes, routine and ritual and going through the motions go out of the window and there's just they might be doing the same things but the heart is so passionately in love with the lord that everything is infused with new meaning i've been reading a book on uh, revivals in scotland and actually it's three volumes <laughs> and uh, uh, john knox the the great reformer had prayed concerning Scotland, and he said this, give me Scotland, lest I die. Uh, what a prayer. And what we find as we look at Scotland, between the 1500s, when John Knox prayed that prayer, somewhere in the 1530s, right the way through to 1940, there was only one decade in Scotland's history where there wasn't revival somewhere. And one of the things that you read about in these revivals is that the regular meetings were so different. Nobody wanted to go home. Nobody, preachers would preach their sermon. And then the people, instead of saying, okay, let's, let's go, let's go to Denny's or let's go and have lunch. They, they didn't want to leave. People didn't want to leave. They said, no, no, please preach some more. We want to hear more from the word of God. And there's such a, a desire and a heart and a hunger for the things of God. And revival brings those kind of changes. I think we desperately need revival today because it's, it's interesting how things that are given by God can become ritualistic and can be a going through the motions if our hearts are not where they ought to be. And so this Passover although there'd been many Passovers before it, this was the one that was so outstanding for obedience to the word of God and for hearts that were passionate. And notice we, we see here that uh, in verse two, it says, he set the priests in their charges and encouraged them to the service of the house of the Lord. And so we see that there's this great encouraging of those that are involved in the service of the house of the Lord they're encouraged in their service. And you see the same thing uh, during the days of Hezekiah. I want you to look back, please. Second Chronicles 29. At this previous great Passover. And we see something of Hezekiah being an encourager of those that are involved in the service of the house of the Lord. Verse 4. It says, he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord of your father, God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of this place. Verse 11, 
my sons be not now negligent for the lord hath chosen you to stand before him to serve him that you should minister unto him and burn incense and so the king is encouraging the priests to be diligent in their service and showing them the majesty of the service god has chosen you as it were to to minister to him to minister to the very heart of god and so there's this great encouragement of the priests in their service and again as a practical note how we need to encourage one another to be diligent in the service of the house of god in our day how we need we heard from thomas yesterday about about barnabas that encourager how we need a barnabas ministry to encourage those uh, in the service of the house of god remember when, when we talk about it today we're not got some special priestly class in the new testament era every believer is a priest every believer is a holy priest every believer is a royal priest how we need to encourage one another in our service of God, to minister to the heart of God and to be diligent in divine service. Notice in verse three of chapter 35, uh, he uh, just kind of shows the Levites the dignity of their office. He said unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy unto the Lord. Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build, so on and so forth. But he, he dignifies their office uh, by reminding them that they are holy unto the Lord. And again, I want to dignify our position in Christ this morning by reminding us from the words of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that you are a holy priesthood. Isn't it amazing to think that we, once sinners of the Gentiles, are now a holy priesthood. I know from my upbringing, growing up in the Catholic Church, I remember as a little boy, just being enamored by the priest, watching him do his things, you know, uh, uh, on the altar as he went about his business. And uh, I even imitated that. I had a, a little box in my bedroom, a cardboard box, and I put a white, a white cloth on it, and I used to pretend that I was a priest. But you know, the amazing thing is I don't have to pretend anymore that because of Christ, I'm now and you too, we are holy priests unto God. Do we realize the dignity of who we are and what we have in Christ? What a privilege. Now, here's a very fascinating thing. In verse three, he says, put the holy ark in the house, which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build shall not be a burden upon you, uh, upon your shoulders. Serve now the Lord your God and his people Israel. Now, doesn't that strike you as kind of mystifying? Why did they have to put the holy ark in the house of God that was built by Solomon? Because there's no record anywhere since the temple was built by Solomon, of the ark ever been taken out. You can search the scriptures diligently and you will not find a single instance once that ark was put in Solomon's temple of it ever been removed. But here, the ark is not there. It's not in the house of God because he's charging the priests. He said to the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy to the Lord, put the holy ark in the house, which Solomon put it there. So how did it, how did it disappear? And some suggestions have been made about this by various commentators. Uh, some say, well, faithful priests removed the ark when Manasseh was so ve vehemently opposed to God and on his rage and rampage against the God of his father, Hezekiah, that out to protect it, priests removed it uh, to, to hide it. Or others have suggested the ark could have been hidden when Judah was threatened by Assyria. Remember when Sennacherib and, and all those uh, the forces were surrounding uh, Jerusalem and, and maybe Hezekiah out of desire to protect it and had it removed. Some suggest that Josiah, and I like this suggestion, symbolically, when he had the house cleaned, 
had removed the ark out of it so it could be thoroughly cleansed of everything that was in there and so that he could put it back as a symbolic gesture that Judah was ready to start again and the symbol of the presence of God had been put back in its rightful place again. I like that idea, right? Put it, putting uh, the symbol of God's presence back where it belonged in the center of the nation, of the worship of the nation. And so that's the suggestion that's being made. And then other suggestions are that it had been removed by Manasseh or Ammon in their defiance of revealed truth and had been replaced by their idols. And we, we don't really know, we can't be dogmatic either way uh, about this, uh, but one way or another, the ark wasn't there and it had to be put back there. And he commands that to happen. And he's basically saying that we can't go forward with the Passover celebration really until the ark is restored to its rightful place and then we can move ahead. Interestingly enough, this is the last historical reference to the ark in scripture. There's, there's no other reference to the Ark of the Covenant now uh, in the historical section of the Old Testament. This is the last reference to it. The last, the principle of last mention, I suppose, in terms of the historical books. But I wanna think about the Ark for a moment and why it's so important. The Ark speaks to God of Christ. It's one of the most expressive types in the whole Levitical system. And the ark was made of shittim wood. And this shittim wood was, was a very hard wood that did not break down and did not corrupt. And it would speak to us of the incorruptible humanity of Christ. Aren't we thankful that Christ not only did not sin, but could not sin, that he is incorruptible in every way. The incorruptible speaks uh, of the undiminished deity of Christ. And the blood on the mercy seat speaks of his accomplished sacrifice and God being propitiated or satisfied with the blood of Christ sprinkled uh, on the mercy seat. And the ark was the very first part of the tabernacle to be made in Exodus 25, uh, showing its importance before any other piece of furniture was made, the ark was the first one. And it's telling us really the, the centrality of the person of Christ to everything we are and we do. He's the only savior of sinners. His blood, as we've thought about this weekend, can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. He's the only savior for sinners. He's the only gathering center for saints, is our Lord Jesus Christ. We often think of Matthew 18, 20, being gathered uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it's wonderful to be gathered to a person and uh, not to a system. Uh, not to some charismatic personality of the present age, but to the person of the Lord Jesus. Uh, as we gather to him, we acknowledge he's Lord. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Acknowledge his lordship. We acknowledge his person. He's Jesus. Jehovah saves, the one who came to save. And we acknowledge Christ, his work, that he is the Messiah, both the suffering Messiah and the Messiah who will reign in glory. And we're gathered to him. And the word gathered in Matthew 18, 20 is in the passive tense, which means that um, the gathering is done by someone else. We're, we're being gathered. The Spirit of God is the one who is bringing us, gathering us to Christ, the object. And I'm saying all that to say this. Sadly, when we get to the Laodicean church, the one who should have been the gathering center where was the Lord Jesus in the church of Laodicea? Just like the ark here in chapter 35 of Second Chronicles, the ark is not where it ought to be 
in the house of God. It's outside. It has to be moved, put back in to its central place. And in the Laodicean church, Christ was no longer the gathering center, but he was outside knocking on the door, trying to get in. Their activity was no doubt very, very busy, but the Lord himself was outside and he was trying to gain entrance. And I want to suggest to you that in times of true revival, the Lord Jesus is always put back into the central place in the hearts and activities of his blood-bought people. Christ is given the rightful place, not a peripheral place, not he's, he's the center of everything. And so we find in verse three, this mysterious verse, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build. And then he uh, begins to talk about service. And uh, he mentions divine service. And I want to just to, again, I love to look at repeated words and phrases. And great theme of this chapter is not just according to, not just the Passover, but it's the word service. Look again, verse 2. He set the priests in their charges and encouraged them to the service of the house of the Lord. Verse 3 at the end, serve now the Lord your God and his people. Verse 10, so the service was prepared. Uh, verse 15, it says towards the end of the verse, it says, uh, they might not depart from their service for their brethren, the Levites, prepared for them. Verse 16, so all the service of the Lord was prepared the same day to keep the Passover. And so what we might say is this, in this first six verses, it's all about the preparation for the Passover. And the preparation of the Passover is it's got to be done according to the writings of David and Solomon and Moses. It's got to be done biblically. It's got to be done right. It's got to be done by a holy priesthood who recognize who they are. It's got to be done in a way that Christ is given the central place of everything. And then those that serve need to recognize the wonderful privilege of serving the Lord. You know, the Apostle Paul, he never got over the fact that not only did God save him, but he counted him worthy, putting him into the ministry. And he just couldn't get over it that not only does God save me, but he wants me on his team. He wants me to serve him. What a privilege to serve him. And in the New Testament, Paul tells us that we, we are all ministers of the new covenant. In other words, we all have the word minister just means servant. We're all servants of the new covenant. Are you excited about the privilege of serving the Lord? Uh, what a joy it is to serve him. And so we see the preparation for the Passover. And now verses 7 through 9, we want to think about the provisions that are made for this Passover. And Josiah, it says, verse 7, gave to the people of the flock, lambs and kids, all for the Passover offerings, for all that were present, to the number of 30,000 and 3,000 bullocks. These were of the king's substance. And so we see the generosity of Josiah in giving liberally to the people for the Passover, as David did uh, when, as he provided for the building of the temple, as uh, Hezekiah did in his day. And now we see that Josiah gives generously. But notice that his act of generosity was a challenge to others, because notice it says in verse 8, and his princes gave willingly unto the people, to the priests, to the Levites, Hilkiah, Zechariah, Jael, rulers of the house of God, gave unto the priests for the Passover offering 2,600 small cattle and 300 oxen. And so the example of Josiah and his great generosity 
was an inspiration to the princes to follow in his footsteps and how we need godly examples today of willingness to give generously to the work of God. And often it inspires others to follow on. And so Josiah uh, inspires the princes, they give to, and they give willingly. There's no begrudging here. God loves a cheerful giver and they're giving out of willing hearts. And again, when days of revival happen, uh, you don't have to beat the saints to get them to give. During revival times, people just want to contribute to the thing that thrills them more than anything else, and it's the work and ways of God. And they're just giving generously. They're living for another world. They're not concerned about this world, and they give, and they give generously. Gener generously. And it's wonderful when leaders inspire the people of God to do large-hearted things for God. And notice um, in verse at nine, it says, Keniah also, Shemaiah, Nethaniel, his brethren, Hashabiah, Jael, uh, Jozebad, chief of the Levites, gave unto the Levites for Passover offerings, 5,000 small cattle, 500 oxen. You add it all together and you, you it's kind of interesting to compare the various uh, givings of the kings. And actually, if you compare this with Hezekiah, Josiah gives double the offerings of Hezekiah's Passover, twice as much, which again just shows this Passover is very special, but it's much less than Solomon's at the dedication of the temple. But we have to remember that Solomon, the nation was at its zenith at that time, and he gave the most, but it's interesting just to compare them. So 10 through 15, verses 10 through 15, we have now the actual celebration of the Passover. So it says the service was prepared, verse 10, and the priests stood in their place. I want to just stop there. In their place. All the preparations had been done and everybody was in their rightful place. And I want us to just notice that again, please. Look at chapter 34, verse 31. And notice what it says. And the king stood in his place. And then our verse, verse 10 the service was prepared and the priests stood in their place. And then verse 15, and the singers, the sons of Asaph, were in their place according to the commandment. And what's wonderful about this is everybody knows their place, the king, the Levites, the singers, and they're all in their place and ready to serve the Lord and do his work. And isn't it wonderful in a local assembly when everybody knows their place and stands in their place to do the work that God has called them to? I don't think there's a more beautiful thing on earth than a truly functioning New Testament assembly where every believer knows their gifting, knows their place, knows their service, and everybody does that which God has called them to do. And the, the, the beautiful result is a wonderful testimony to God and to his workings in people's hearts. And that's what we find here in this particular festival, that everybody knew their place, everybody took their place. And so it says they killed the Passover, and the priests sprinkled the blood from their hands the Levites flayed them. So they're all kind of working together, the priests, the Levites, uh, all doing their, their part in this service. They removed the burnt offerings that they might give according to the divisions of the families of the people to offer to the Lord as it's written in the book of Moses. And so did they with the oxen. There's another, as it is written, according to, as it is written, they roasted the Passover with fire according to the ordinance. And uh, remember that the Passover originally was to be eaten in haste, and you, you see some of uh, this same thing uh, in verse 13, where it says, uh, they roasted the Passover with fire according to the ordinance, but the other holy off offerings sod they in pots and in cauldrons and in pans and divided them speedily among all the people. Because this is, this is a challenge, really. This is not just like the regular Passover 
in Exodus 12, where it was a family event, this is now a national event. And so all the nations gathered together and the distribution of portions uh, of the offering was going to take a lot of diligent work and service and everything is given out and there's great uh, service going on and haste in service to make sure everything's distributed the way it should. And notice it, how unselfishly uh, that this is done. Again, we see this in verse 13, that um, as they distribute these things, they start with the people. It says they divided them speedily amongst the people. And then later on, we're going to see they served the the priests uh, and and the uh, the Levites. Uh, afterwards, they made ready for themselves and for the priests. And so you notice this principle that, that, that there was no selfishness here. The people first and then themselves and the priests afterwards. And, and again, I want to just make a contrast with 1 Corinthians 11. Do you remember part of the difficulty in the assembly in 1 Corinthians? That everybody at the love feast was feeding their own faces and they weren't being considerate about others. Let's just go, go there. The, the selfishness seemed to dominate in the Corinthian assembly because of their carnality when they came together. First Corinthians 11, let's just look at a few verses here. Verse 17. First Corinthians 11, 17, it says, Now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worst. Isn't it terrible? To go to to come together, to gather, and actually be worse off because you gathered than if you didn't gather. Like we we all we love to say, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst, and not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. But at this point in the history of the assembly in Corinth, in Corinth, people were worse off coming together. It wasn't for the better; it was for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there's divisions among you, and I partly believe it. They've got sex in the, in the meeting. Everybody's got their own following. When you come together, it's into one place. It's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, and everyone takes before other his own supper. One is hungry, another is drunken. What, have you no houses to eat and drink in, or despise you the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And of course, we recognize that there were some serious implications of this. They were, they were eating the bread and drinking the cup in an unworthy manner, and they were drinking judgment unto themselves. And, uh, and, and so it's refreshing, really, to see the contrast between what's happening here in Second Chronicles 35 the, just the sheer unselfishness. Others first. You know the acronym JOY? I know you know it well. Jesus first, others second, yourselves last. That's what the recipe for real lasting joy. And so there's service going on, and the service is sacrificial. It's selfless. It's caring about the needs of others before that of themselves. So we come to the concluding summary of this Passover. Verse 16, so all the service of the Lord was prepared the same day to keep the Passover and to offer burnt offerings upon the altar to the Lord according to the commandment of King Josiah. And so again, the king so faithful to the word of God uh, encourages everybody uh, bowed his heart is bowed before the word of God and he's concerned for the spiritual well-being of the saints now we do look back to second kings 23 and verse 25 just to see something here second kings 23 verse 25 speaking of king Josiah it says and like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul 
and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. Isn't, isn't that a beautiful testimony to this king? That, that he turned to the Lord with all his heart, all his soul, all his might. Isn't that what the Lord Jesus said was the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your might, all your strength. And this is exactly what he did. I want to remind us that at, at this time in the history of the Houston Assemblies, after a hundred years of faithful testimony, this might be a very appropriate weekend to ask ourselves in the presence of God, are we serving the Lord with all our hearts and all our might and all our strengths? You see, not only are we priests, but we're kings in waiting. Remember Revelation 5? When the lamb takes the scroll and it says, and we are kings and priests and shall reign on the earth. And so we're kings in waiting. And so are we like this king who serves the Lord with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul? I want you to imagine what the Houston assemblies would be like in the next few years if every saint in fellowship served the Lord with all their heart, all their mind, and all their strength. Do you think that that would have any impact on the testimony? I think it would really have an impact on the testimony. Notice verse 17 of chapter 35. It says, And, is, and the children of Israel that were present kept the Passover at that time. Notice all the way through this, there's, there's not just a heart for Judah, he's the king of Judah, but he also has a heart, as we learned from Manasseh, Naphtali, uh, the various tribes, he goes up to Bethel. Uh, he's, he, he has a burden, not just for those in his immediate vicinity, but he has a burden for all the people of God. And I want to suggest to you, too, that um, in, at least for, for myself, uh, in praying for revival, of course, I fellowship in New Testament assemblies by conviction. I'm in fellowship in a New Testament assembly because I believe that it is the pattern revealed in Scripture. And, and I long to see revival in the assemblies where Christians are gathered to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. But I have to tell you, I don't just want to see revival amongst us. I would love to see the whole church of God revived, whatever they call themselves, Baptist, Presbyterian, uh, Pentecostal. It doesn't make any difference. I would long, I'd long to see the church of Christ, every but true born again believer, because revival is starts always with the people of God. Awakening is what happens to the unsaved as a result of seeing a revived church. And my desire is that all the church, whatever they call themselves, might experience revival. And so he says, verse 18, there was no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. Neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept. We already mentioned this, but remember we said the king says there was no Passover since the days of judges. And here it says since Samuel. Is there a contradiction? No, no contradiction at all, because Samuel was the last of the judges. And so it's really talking about the same period. He was the last of the judges. The period of the kings begins when Samuel anoints Saul, right? So he's the last of the judges. And so it's going back to that period, that era, and he's saying this Passover was so outstanding, there was none like it. And it's, we're told, this all happened in the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. That 18th year was an amazing year for Josiah and for Israel. It was, a, it was an incredible year. It was the year of the restoration of the house of God. 
It had been refurbished. It had been cleansed of all its idolatry. The, the ark had been put back in its rightful place. It was the year of the rediscovery of the word of God. They found the book and the word of God was put in again in its preeminent place amongst the people of God. Christ was in his right place. The word of God was in its right, rightful place. And it was the year of the greatest Passover since the day of Judges. Could the hundredth year of the Houston Assembly testimony end as a year never to be forgotten? Not because of COVID-19, but because the saints of God were revived. Christ was given his rightful place. The word of God was given its rightful place amongst the saints. And the remembrance, the difference between the Passover and the Lord's Supper is the Passover was remembering an event. The Lord's Supper is remembering a person. And oh, what a joy it is to remember that beloved person. So, one more thing, one more P. We've looked at the Passover. We've got to think about the passing. We're going to do it very, very quickly. And it's really a kind of a, a sad ending in many ways. Because what we find is that Josiah dies in battle. He goes out to meet verse 20 after all this when josiah had prepared the temple nico king of egypt came up to fight against carchemish by euphrates and josiah went out against him and what we find is that josiah he went out and i want you to notice just something about josiah uh, it, let's just read a bit further it says verse 21 but he sent ambassadors to him saying what have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war for God. Command me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him, and hearkened not to the words of Nico from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. One of the great strengths of Josiah was his determination. Remember, we saw back in our, the beginning of our study in verse 34, chapter 34, verse 2, that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. And what we see is that there was a stubborn pursuit after doing uh, what was right in the sight of the Lord. And, and this determination, he, he wouldn't budge from the right to the left. And so he, he's got this, this stubbornness about him, determination, which is a good thing if it's done in the right way. But sometimes a man's greatest strength can also become his greatest weakness. And that stubbornness, when this Pharaoh Nico came into the land, it says Josiah wouldn't turn his face from him. <laughs> In other words, I'm not going to budge to the right or to the left. That stubbornness. And what Josiah failed to do, and we don't read of it here, is he didn't seek guidance from the Lord. Pharaoh Nico says, I'm on the, the, the errand of, of God. And he did not seek God for guidance. And he stubbornly set his face to not budge and to fight. And he disguised himself. Listen, when you've got to disguise yourself, something's not right. Right? Uh, it's not right if you've got to disguise yourself. There's something not quite right here. And he hearkened not to the words of Nico from the mouth of God, and he died in battle. And so it's a kind of a sad ending. And, and yet it's interesting as we, we think of it that um, he, uh, he, he died in this, this manner, and uh, it, it's, it behoves us, I suppose, to make sure 
no matter how many successes we've had in the past, that we don't ever lose sight of our dependence upon God and our need to constantly seek his direction and his guidance. Now, before we're too hard on Josiah, there was another great man of God called Joshua. And you remember there was a time in Joshua's life where he failed to seek counsel from the hands of the Lord. Remember when the Gibeonites came and they'd, they were wearing a disguise too. They were all as if they'd been traveling a long way and just Joshua failed to seek counsel from the Lord. So our man, he dies 39 years of age, but what an impact he had. One wonders, and there's no point speculating, but one wonders what would have happened if he sought counsel from the Lord and had not gone to battle against Pharaoh Nico. What we do know is verse 25, it says, Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. And all the singing men and singing women spake of Josiah in their lamentations to this day. And actually there was a great mourning and lamentation for him because he was a huge loss, because he'd been an amazing leader. Their mourning because of the death of the last good king of Judah. I want you to turn with me now to Zechariah, the book of the prophecy of Zechariah. And we want to see another reference to the mourning of Josiah. And it's found in Zechariah chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 10. It says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning in Hadad Rimmon in the valley of Megiddo. The same extent of mourning that occurred for the last great king of Judah when he died will once again come upon the nation of Israel when their final and greatest king will be recognized. When they look on him whom they've pierced and realize we've crucified our own Messiah and they will mourn with that same morning that you find in Second Chronicles 35, the morning of Hadad Rimmon in the Valley of Negadon, the very same morning that was seen here for Josiah. So thus endeth the story of godly King Josiah. And again, my whole burden for sharing it with us is that I think the parallels are quite remarkable that we too find ourselves, look, just like he did, judgment is imminent. No question about it. As you look around you, uh, the Lord says you don't know the day or the hour, but you ought to know the signs of the times. And it seems to me that we're hurtling towards the end of the age. The church age is coming to a close. Could it be that enough, if enough people like Josiah take his place, as it were, with a burden for revival, with a brokenness in his presence, God who can't resist a broken and contrite spirit might just visit us with one last halicon glorious day like this great Passover before the terrible coming of the Lord. Are you praying to that end? Are you going to join us and many others around this land who are praying? Lord, will you not revive us again, that your people might rejoice in thee. May God encourage us to consider these things 
as we think about his word together. Let's pray. Father, we can't help but thank you for your faithfulness to the Houston assemblies over the last hundred years. Uh, we marvel really at the many faithful servants that have worked so hard conference after conference to make these times a time of edification and upbuilding for the people of God. Lord, we just bless you for your faithfulness to us. And yet, Father, we, we want to ask you that we might not just keep going like we did before, but we might experience something of a reviving in the testimony. Lord, we pray that every saint might consider their lives in the light of the life of Josiah, king of Judah. So it says that, that there was no king like him because what he did, he did with his whole heart and soul and strength. God, would you search us, search our hearts today and ask ourselves the question in your presence, is our service wholehearted or is it half-hearted? Could it improve? Could we be more devoted to the one who gave himself for us? Christ, our Passover, who was sacrificed for us? Or maybe some of us have been on that altar in Romans 12, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. But because we're living sacrifices, it's so easy sometimes to get off the altar. Well, maybe there's a time this weekend for some of us to crawl back on to the altar and say, Lord, forgive us. We got off, but we want to get back on again. Such as we are, we want to present ourselves to you in fresh ways to serve you until the Lord Jesus comes. And Lord, in mercy, would you not revive us again, that your people might rejoice in thee. And we'll give thee all the glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.